Everybody, welcome to another installment of Show to Be with Mike G, the show of life, the show of grunge music, manifesto, Kansas City, barbecue, and so much more with today's guest, one of the men behind Jay Rieger Company, the Rieger Manifesto, Kansas City's own Mr. Ryan Maybe. Ryan, Tom, and Andy, the trio, were just in Texas doing a small tour talking about Jay Rieger and Company. And Ryan and I sat down and talked about life, his journey in this industry, and how he's been such an influence on the national cocktail scene, but also such an impactful personality and presence in the Kansas City cocktail scene. But there's lots to talk about here, how Ryan gets his inspiration for hospitality, how he's a guitar player, how Jay Rieger and company pays homage to the past, and how all of that unfolded. We talked to Tom Nickel on Monday, and this just rounds things out wonderfully with the Jay Rieger crew. So without further ado, I hope... Hope you guys enjoyed this chat with Ryan Maybe. We're in a town called Parkville. Uh, this is on the north suburbs of Kansas City. What what I would expect of a suburb, or is it more farmy and? Uh, no, it's it's your typical uh, city suburb. Uh, you know, I think if you get a little bit further out, it's it's kind of close to the airport, which oh, okay. is is fairly rural. Yeah. Uh, so there are some elements of of farmland and and rural areas. But I grew up in a in a you know kind of a little subdivision type what, area. What kinds of things were you doing? Were you sports? You I mean pretty tall guy? Were you doing basketball or baseball? You know, honestly, I didn't. I was a really a really big baseball fan. Yeah. Um, as a little kid, so I'm a, a diehard Royals, Royals fan man. all the way. Absolutely. George Brett. Oh, man. Well, Bo Jackson was my favorite. When oh I was no a kid. shit! Yeah, really? he was my idol. When I was when I was young, how did he do it? Both. He wasn't uh, very good at football. He was, I think he was a better baseball player. Didn't I think he was just a, an absolute machine yeah. in both. But then he ended up getting injured, you know, playing football and right. it ruined his career. But um, was, I remember yeah. that shit, the Nike stuff. But yeah, so it's, yeah. Uh, sports is a huge part of that. That absolutely, area, yeah. right? Yeah, I mean, it was pretty big. I, I didn't uh, I didn't do high school sports. I ended up uh, uh, going into music and played in the high school marching band and oh, okay. symphonic band. What'd you play? I played trombone and baritone. No. Euphonium. Euphonium? Yeah. The heaviest instrument that there is. Yeah. I would watch. There was this guy, because I was, I was an alto sax guy. Nice. <sighs> never got girls doing that. <laughs> no. That's why I started playing guitar. <laughs> right. I never uh, got girls doing same that. Here. So it you know, yeah. happens. But there was this really small, diminutive dude, and he was probably about five foot flat. And uh-huh. he had that, that, the baritone, like right on top of him, and it was about half his size. And I'm like, this is an instrument that engulfs its players. Absolutely, you yeah. might be the only guy I've ever seen that could make it look like it's a normal instrument. Uh, it, yeah, I mean, it really it fit pretty well. You know, it just seemed to be built for me. I, I liked it. Yeah. Well, so all right, so you transitioned into guitar because you got smart. I, I ultimately did that too. Like, well, actually, my first guitar I got when I was five years old. Oh, really? It's a Dukes of Hazard guitar. <laughs> Daisy Duke on it, like painted on the <laughs> it was inlet? like the, it was like the Duke. The Duke Brothers and Daisy, you know, on the... Boss Hogs. It was, like, it was a toy guitar, but yeah, it was my first awesome. guitar when I was a kid. I was like five. Was it, did your folks play at all? No. No, no my parents were not uh, uh, musically inclined one bit. What kind of industries were they in? Very blue collar. I had a really uh, really modest upbringing. Um, neither of my parents went to college. Um, my dad, uh, just like his dad, worked on the assembly line at... Uh, General Motors. Oh no kidding! Uh, and my uncle and my aunt and like it was very much that's just what our family did. They yeah. worked for GM. Um, really big in Kansas City, the the General Motors Fairfax. I didn't know there. that. Yeah. Um, and then my mom uh, ran a house cleaning service. She you know cleaned people's homes. So, so, so it's it kind of the bug, the hospitality bug. Yeah. So to speak, it always I always find like it comes from somewhere, but it sounds like the maybe the ability to like operationalize something and do it the same every time, which when you have a distillery's kind of piece of it. Maybe Absolutely. that comes from your dad, but otherwise... The- yeah, well, I, the hospitality thing, I can go on about that. I, I'm very passionate about that subject. And I think there's an inherent uh, nature of hospitality just in the Midwest. Yeah. And my uh, my grandparents on my mom's side, uh, they were farmers. So she grew up on a farm oh, I see. out in 
way out in the middle of nowhere in Kansas. Um, and I, as a kid, we would go there at least once a year during the summer during mm-hmm. harvest. So we were always there during uh, during the harvest of the the wheat and corn. Wheat, fields. okay, okay, yeah. And I, uh, I I give a lot of credit to my my grandmother um, because she was I think the hardest working person of that entire group, you know. And it was my grandfather and and my uh, uncles and and extended cousins and everything yeah. that were out, you know, in the field. And it's brutal it's work. Too, yeah. But my grandmother was constantly, you know, from early morning to late at night, cooking, cleaning, taking care of them. Yeah, you know, and she loved it. She was like probably the happiest person I've ever met. She absolutely just loved taking care of people. And I never really acknowledged it then when mm-hmm. I was a kid. But looking back now, it, it means so a lot. Right. And I'm like, you, you ask where that hospitality bug comes from? I mean, that's, that's, that's pretty clear. clearly the, the, the place that I, I got it. You yeah. know? And, and it, was just, it was just nature. It was just the way that, that she was. She loved it. That's amazing that that's kind of like the, the preface or the pretext to, to getting into this industry. So... But before that, like as a school kid, were you pretty good getting good grades? Staying yeah, in mostly. School? I was, uh, yeah, I was always in like the the gifted and accelerated programs when I was younger, and uh. Uh, I was I was a really good student, straight A student, and then uh, I, uh, up into high school, didn't really because my parents didn't go to college, um, mm-hmm. and they they didn't put a lot of emphasis on that. You know, they never said you have to go to college. You know, right. they never really pushed me. Uh, so it was more or less at that point, I kind of figured, well, I don't really know what I should be doing. I don't even know if I should care yeah. about getting these good grades. Having you know? parents that maybe ha- have done it can lead by example, right? Because right. they're like, well, this is how you do the thing. This yeah. is how you submit to schools. But if they don't have that, it's hard for yeah. just to figure it out yourself. Sure. So I kind of lost my way a little bit in high school and ended up uh, you know, not doing so great and, and just not sure about what I wanted to do with my life. Yeah. Um, ultimately... Uh, you know, got things turned around and um, went, paid my own way through college as a bartender. Okay. And, and what, what were you studying? Um, well, initially music. Uh, when I first started going to school, I wanted to pursue music. I was, I was playing in a band and um, I wanted to, uh, uh, I knew how to read sheet music yeah. uh, for euphonium. Sure. Um, but I didn't know how to apply it to guitar and I knew how to play guitar. Yeah. Uh, so I kind of wanted to, to hone my skills there, but uh, that changed a, a couple of times, and I'll, I'll, the reason it changed was I was bartending at this really fantastic restaurant in Kansas City called mm. Pierpont's. Okay. Uh, and I was 22, 23 at the time. What year are we talking, roughly? We're talking 2000. I, it opened in 1999, and I was on the opening team. Oh, wow. Uh, I was the apprentice bartender. I was 21, and uh, I don't even know how I got that job. <laughs> it was way out of my league. Um, so, uh, you know, I ended up getting this really killer bartending gig and i just took to it it Mm. it just i loved it i loved it and i i moved up really quickly um i was there for five years but it only took about two years or so for me to realize like this is what i want to do so during that time period i kind of transitioned my studies in college to business yeah uh, because i knew that i wanted to own my own bar one day were you so were you playing like with the music piece of it were you out and about and playing and have some high hopes there to do yeah well i mean high hopes as far as like Sure, you want to be a rock star, but right. the reality is that you know that's not very practical. Looking back, um, did you would you consider yourself a good rock star? Um, no, probably <laughs> not. <laughs> um, so I, I played in a lot of different bands. I played in a, a kind of a bluesy rock band that mm-hmm. had a, a female lead singer. She was very Janis Joplin like. Yeah, uh, she was fantastic. Um, and I played in a more of kind of an acoustic, stripped down, like folksy. Uh, bluegrass type band yeah, yeah. Uh, acoustic you know called daybreak um I, I did a few different things were those kind of more the time. influences then like folky and bluesy or Just were you a different rock guy things no, i was a rock guy man my, my favorite band of all time is led zeppelin oh, yeah. I, I you know growing up in the 90s i really got into the the grunge scene and so yeah. pearl jam Soundgarden, austin chains um, oh, oh, yeah. honey like wow they're absolutely a little bit before, yeah so that's really the stuff that that influenced me but then later on you know just started exploring more uh more styles and genres and yeah. uh, bluegrass is one that kind of popped up and I really like that. Well, it comes from that area too. Yeah. I mean, jazz as well, yeah. but, you know, well, it sounds like, do you find, I feel like it's not that jarring of a transition into hospitality or crafting cocktails. If you think about it. Okay. Writing oh, yeah. a song yeah. is about a melody and harmony. Yeah. Tell me that a cocktail, how do, do you see some similarities in crafting oh, I, a cocktail? I, I say that all the time. Yeah. Um, I love to draw that analogy and, and those parallels. And I think that's why I, I really ended up loving 
uh, being a bartender yeah. because there was that creative element, you know, when it comes That's to right. creating a cocktail. Now, now, this is back in 1999, 2000. You know, we weren't experiencing the, the craft cocktail craze that we are now, and you didn't have this, like, massive wave of new cocktails coming out right, and the right. ability to create new things. But um, I realized that I could right away. And I think my creative uh, passion, you know, for, like, writing songs yeah. and, and playing music was instantly applied to creating cocktails. It's so crazy. Bass, mid, treble. It's Absolutely. all in a fucking cocktail. Balance, yeah. you know. And then also you get to be a showman. Yeah, I that's mean, true. You get to perform. As, yeah. a, as a bartender, that's a big part of the gig is, is putting on a show and entertaining people. Yeah. And I loved it, man. I, I just, uh, I, I really took to it and it felt very, very comfortable and very natural. And so I'm like, this is what I want to do. So you're sharpening your teeth in the business aspect of well and in yeah. academia while also kind of like executing it. Did you a- end up finishing up? Yeah, I got an associate's degree in business, um, and that's it. And I, I stopped after that because I, uh, I knew. I yeah. just knew what I wanted. And so while I could have gone on and, and uh, you know, got a four-year degree, a bachelor's degree, I really, you know, maybe it was arrogance, but I, I didn't feel like I needed it. I felt like in order to uh, achieve my goals, yeah. it was best that I, like, focus on those things and, like, actively do them. You ha- you're right. You have to. I think it's good to have some book smarts with it. Yeah. Right. It, it, that just backs it up. You got to fucking execute. Right. You got to be in the trenches, dude. You just have to. You got to carry amps upstairs. I yeah. say that every, <laughs> like almost every conversation I have. Until you set up a drum kit after having to take it up two flights of stairs, you don't understand. Right. It's that's how it is. Now you just, you gotta you gotta put in the work. That's right. And so. Was there an aha moment for you where these skills you're kind of learning, crafting cocktails, that you say, I can do this myself? I think, I think I'm think i ready to have my own place. Um, yeah, so the, like crafting, the, the crafting of the cocktail thing, was that was pretty instantaneous. Oh. Um, and it was, it was totally by accident. I'll, I'll, the story's kind of funny. Um, the, the restaurant, if you look it up, Pierpont's at Union uh-huh. Station, is absolutely stunning. It's in the old Union uh, Station, oh, wow. uh, train station in, in Kansas City, which was uh, abandoned for decades and falling apart and the city was trying to figure out what to do with it um some people wanted to tear it down and yeah. you know thank god they didn't you know it's a stunning old building um so back in 1999 it was officially reopened after like a 250 million dollar restoration project yeah and that's where the, the restaurant is and the the back bar is uh, 20 feet high it's over 20 feet high the back bar with a rolling library ladder Holy it's absolutely shit. stunning just and like wood, like beautiful wood and stuff. Everything. So yeah. it's like this old, uh, it's, you know, kind of an art deco-ish design, or a little bit pre-art deco design yeah. um, with uh, a lot of like uh, molded plaster. And then the back bar is the combination of uh, wooden uh, cabinets as well as uh, metal railings and glass and mirrors. And it's wow. just absolutely just beautiful. It's one of the most beautiful bars that I've still to this day ever seen. Yeah. Um, now, I was uh, a kid when I started that job, you know, with no experience and all the guys that I work with, they were all seasoned veteran bartenders at that point. You know, mm-hmm. they were in their forties and fifties and been doing this for, uh, you know, 10, 15, 20 years yeah. and knew all about wine and scotch and cigars and, and port and you name it. Right. Um, so I was the, I was the apprentice, the little kid on the totem pole, but on, on this back bar, they didn't want to climb up to the top shelf. <laughs> so they put all the crap on the very top shelf that nobody wanted. And I do mean like really bad stuff. Back okay, then. so except bad for there was a stuff. couple. Well, yeah, there were a couple things like chartreuse. Oh like shit! They put green chartreuse up there. Yeah. Um, because back then nobody really ordered. No, it. No, they didn't even you know, know what it was. Like, no, no one, no one ever wanted the last word. Or yeah. you know, it wasn't like a, a trendy bartender bartender thing then. So they put that up there. But then like tequila rose, and right? Like really oh, nasty stuff like yeah, that. Yeah. Um, so they put all this stuff on the top shelf because they didn't want to climb up there. But what do you think every guest that came into the bar asked? They're just in awe looking up at this beautiful bar and yeah. they're like, what do I have to order to make you go to, I just want to see you climb to the top. <laughs> and unfortunately it was, oh, the answer was always, oh, there's nothing up there that you want really, yeah. you know, until um, it was like a month after we opened and it was uh, Christmas of uh, 1999. Mm. And uh, this uh, electrical company bought out the entire restaurant, uh, closed private party for like 300 people. And they yeah. just got nuts. They got out of control. And this guy that I worked with, he used to run up the ladder and slide down to get down quicker. And I never tried that because okay. I was afraid of like just falling rolling, rolling in an ankle, you yeah. know. And I'm kind of clumsy and kind of a, a bigger guy, so I didn't really, I didn't really uh, attempt that ever. But uh, the, the bar was packed. People were, were 
you know, having a great time. And he goes up there and he slides down and everyone just starts cheering and screaming. And I'm down like at the other end of the bar in the mm. service well and they're like high-fiving me and they're throwing 20s on the bar and just freaking out. And this woman points out the bottle of tequila rose oh, to shit. me. And she's like, I want you to go up there and get that for me. I'm like, all right, you oh. insist. You know, so I run up there and I grab the bottle and the entire crowd starts screaming and cheering, slide, slide, slide. And my heart's pounding like i'm terrified it's right, right. 20 feet that's uh that's significant yeah you'll fuck you know? your leg you'll do something yeah. right and uh i'm really truly scared but then i'm also scared like if i if i don't slide down the ladder i'm gonna get booed that's yeah. gonna suck you know booed off so, stage man <laughs> right, <laughs> right and so i did it man i literally like i stuffed the bottle in my apron and i closed my eyes and i just let go and just shot down that ladder and people just started freaking out and then uh, at that point, it's easy. You know, you can yeah. get past that initial fear. And right, like, right. Wow, that, that wasn't so bad, you know. And so the other bartender and I, Charles, uh, we just started doing that back and forth all night. And we walked out of there that night with like 1600 bucks. Holy shit. You know, and I'm a, a, a college kid trying to make my own way. Yeah. And that's massive money. And oh, so yeah. I, the wheels just started turning. And I went to my boss after that night. And I was like, what if I created a drink? And we put the ingredients on the top shelf and every time and call like the ladder shot. Or That's something right. Like yeah. That. And every time somebody orders it, climb up there, uh, take a little mini shaker, like a little cobbler shaker, yeah, yeah. mix it up, shoot down the ladder. And he's like, I love it. Come up with a drink and we'll put it on the menu. That's incredible. And that was the first drink that I ever created. Yeah. Um, and that was kind of that moment where we're like, wow, you know, this is, this is a lot of fun. What's a shrewd business move though? See, that's the thing is that, oh yeah, you made a cocktail, but like, the execution of the cocktail and the kitschiness of the process is what makes it really resonate. And so you yeah. can see that. It's yeah. a pretty shrewd move. Think yeah. about so it. So that, you know, that was the, the very first step in, you know, just the first drink I ever made, which yeah. it wasn't a very good drink. It was just it matter, kind of a, a sweet shot, you know. Yeah. Um, but that didn't matter. It was all about uh, the fact that I was creating something and applying it yeah. uh, to the business. And ended up getting written about in the local newspaper and then it got published in bartender magazine and this is all by the time i'm like 22. damn and so it, it just seemed like wow this is not I'm, a bad natural yeah case. and so i started digging deeper and deeper into the restaurant side of the business learning about the food from the chefs and uh we had like a two hundred thousand dollar wine inventory a really massive wine list it was a steakhouse yeah. and so i started exploring wine i eventually got my sommelier certification while i was uh, working there, mm. uh, took over the wine list, uh, became uh, kind of the head bartender and was like managing the inventory, doing ordering, creating cocktails, um, all that stuff. So starting to learn the the nuts and bolts behind the scenes too. Do you find yourself, and I, I think I know the answer to this, but it, are you an inquisitive, curious guy? Oh yeah, absolutely. So having what is ultimately like the Library of Congress of Spirits and Wines, how'd you feel about having such deep access to all these things you could learn about. Oh, it was fascinating. Yeah. There was always something new. Every single day, you know, I'm learning about something new and I wanted to know everything. Yeah. And it's really funny too, that that restaurant, so we had this guy um, who was kind of an early mentor of mine. He was this really dapper older gentleman. His name was Ron Barkley and mm -hmm. he uh, ran a lot of uh, old school restaurants back in the 70s and 80s and he was kind of, kind of a consultant for this place when it first opened. Mm -hmm. And he wanted us to have, since it was such an historic building, and beautiful bar he wanted us to have a classic cocktail menu so in 1999 we had a classic cocktail menu with drinks like a sazerac on it and uh, uh you know a silver gin fizz yeah. and a ramos and you know all of these like old school cocktails um we had listed and we were supposed to be able to make but nobody ever showed us how to make them nobody ever taught us how to make them and then nobody ever ordered them i mean i was making like two or three hundred cosmopolitans a night, sure. you know, apple martinis, chocolate martinis. Nobody wanted a Sazerac, you know, and I didn't know what it was. So I actually one day, uh, a few months after we opened, um, I'm like, well, we got this list of cocktails and we haven't even been trained on them and I don't know what they are. So I, slow night, I go to my boss. I'm like, what's a Sazerac? And he goes, I don't know. Let's look it up. <laughs> and so <Jeez>. he gets <laughs> some shitty cocktail book and yeah. flips through it and he kind of points me in the right direction and tells me what to do. And it was the worst thing I've ever tasted. I mean, we built it all wrong. Well, first yeah. off, you know, absinthe was not legal back then. Right, right. 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 Um, we didn't have Patriots bitters. We had Angostura. Oh. Um, we did have rye. We had old Overholt rye. One rye. On I mean, that's bar, which was actually kind of a big thing in Kansas City even at that time period. Yeah. But 
Um, so I made the Sazerac that was completely wrong, like built over ice uh, with rye and ango and probably a sugar packet because we didn't have sugar cubes. Yeah. You know, and then floated perno pastis on top. I'm just kind of cringing some. a little bit. Yeah, you know? no, yeah, it, was, yeah. it, was, it was absolutely terrible. And I took one sip of that, and I was like, oh, that's awful. And so did he. And he's like, yeah, I don't sell that. I'm like, don't worry. I'm not going not gonna to recommend it. And then I didn't hear anything about the Sazerac for another two years until uh, this guy came into the bar uh, a couple years later. And um, I, I can even remember his face to this day because it was such a, a, an interesting moment for me. He says... He's looking at the back bar and he goes, I see you have the ingredients to make me a Sazerac. And I'm like, I hadn't heard that that yeah. drink name in a couple of years. I'm like, yeah, I don't think you want that though. <laughs> and he just kind of laughed and he's like, tell you what, how about I walk you through how to make it? And he taught me how to make it correctly. The guest taught me how to make it correctly. We had bar spoons back then, but we yeah. didn't ever use them. We never stirred anything. We shook everything. Right. So he had me stirring it, right? We also had a product at that point called Grand Absente, which was an early knockoff of Absente. It was okay. closer than, uh, you know, Pernod or something like that. Right. But it was still not quite the real legit stuff, but it was close enough to sure. kind of get there. Give the flavor, yeah. um, so he had me use that and do the rinse of the, the glass, you know, and, and stir um, stir the whiskey. And we had Peixot's bitters by that time and, uh, you know, had me do everything the way that he wanted. And I was just like, all right, you know, and then I, he allows me to taste it, you know? And I was blown away because essentially we were using the same ingredients right. as that time I had made it two years earlier, but the result was entirely Profoundly different. different. Yeah. And it was subtle and balanced. And that was the, it really, something really clicked. You give the guy the same, you give two different people the same guitar, they're going to do completely exactly. different things with it, right? Exactly. And then I started to think, well, there's something to be said about the technique here and the, and the preparation methods. Yeah. And that inspired me to go out and kind of look more into this cocktail thing. And so I go to Barnes & Noble and I'm looking in the, the book section and there's this book, Craft of the Cocktail, uh, by Dale DeGroff. Mm -hmm. And I have no idea who Dale DeGroff is, but I get this book and I start reading it and my eyes are just, you know, popping out of my head. And I go in uh, to the bar the next day and I, I've got this book with me and I tell one of the older bartenders, I'm like, this guy says we're doing everything wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and what do you have to say about that, right, boss? <laughs> right. And the older bartender just was, was like, yeah, he doesn't know what he's talking about. You know, kind of blew it off. Yeah. So we never really, during my five years at, at Pierpont's, we never really took the cocktail element to the place where, you know, things are today. Um, but the that seed was planted. That's. It feels like everything is just percolating. It's yeah. like, the Beatles meet finally because of a friend. It's like John and Paul, yeah. they meet serendipitously. And it feels like this thing, like the next thing that happens, I have a feeling it's going to be something very, very incredible. Yeah. So what is the next move? Well, I, I, uh, I left that job. Yeah. Well, um, you have to. Um, I had to. And that, and that was actually kind of tough because I, I loved it. Five years, I never walked into that building feeling like I don't want to be here. Right. I really was lucky and, and, and fortunate and, and loved it. But I knew that I wanted to own my own place one day. Yeah. And I was so comfortable as a bartender there that I was afraid I'd wake up one day and it would be too late and I'd still be, you know, mopping floors at 3 a.m. And Where did um, you get your ambition? Because this is a thing that, that's, ambition is the invisible thing that keeps moving you forward. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, I don't know. I think maybe it was a, a combination of things. My parents' indifference, really. <laughs> was, you know, I think that, <laughs> like, well, reaction. okay, if they're not going to, if they're not going to, you know, push me to, to, to do things yeah. and I'm going to, I'm going to find a way on my own. I, I love really that know. indifference is the impetus yeah, right. for ambition. <laughs> right. It's kind of ironic. <laughs> you know, it was a little bit of a rebelliousness, maybe a little yeah. bit of rebellion. Uh, you know. But that's a great, it turned out to be really kind of the, the, the guiding light in a sense, yeah. you know, that rebellious nature. Yeah. So yeah, I quit. Um, it was a tough thing to do, but I quit and got a job as a sales rep for a fine wine distributor. Cause mm. I had my SOM certification at that point was really into wine um and i hated it i can't imagine I hated you, that yeah. job <laughs> i really did but i i felt like i had to do it because i wanted to see how other bars operated yeah knowing that i wanted to open up my own bar um it's like I reconnaissance figured, almost isn't it yeah i get to bounce around i get to work with wine lists on in other bars and everybody does things different you know so like maybe i can learn something from them if i just stick within these four walls yeah the whole time i'm only going to learn what's within these four walls but if i have 70 or 80 accounts and i learn how those buyers run their wine lists, mm -hmm. you know, and those buyers run their bars. And if I get to learn a little bit, take a little bit from the import side too, you know, and learn about how the import 
uh, industry works and yeah. how the distribution uh, side of things works. I think it would give me, I felt like it would give me some uh, advantage once I got around to opening up my own Absolutely, place. Absolutely, yeah. So that was that was the impetus. That was the reason. Um, and I, I, fortunately, I only did it for a year and a half. And during that time period, uh, figured out uh, a way to open up my first bar. Which was which was. I was actually one. a wine bar. I opened in 2006 in downtown Kansas City in a really abandoned old neighborhood uh, of downtown KC where there wasn't much going on, and it yeah. was uh, it was called JP Wine Bar and Coffee House, and we were open at 6:30 a.m. every day and closed at 1:30, and uh, did coffee in the morning and had uh, small plates in the evening and and a fully stocked bar and 50 wines by the glass and had live jazz. Wow. And, uh, How old was, were you at this point? I was 28. Shit, man! First bar before 30. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty. That's impressive. Do you, do you ever get a chance to kind of reflect on that stuff? All the time, yeah. You know, I'm still in that neighborhood, and I don't have that bar anymore. And it's not, it's not under the same ownership or yeah. same name, but it's still there. And I know that I had a lot to do with building it. You know, and I'm friends with the people that that uh, um, run it. So I get to go in a lot and and still experience, it, and it's still part of our community. Yeah. So yeah, absolutely. I reflect on that quite a bit. That's, I mean, it's good because I think you've done quite a bit of stuff, man, like academically, professionally. And if you don't take that time to say, okay, I have done some shit. Yeah. Then it doesn't, I, I don't think you can be as humble. You know right. What I mean? Yeah. Well, so obviously there, there are a few other projects which we'll talk about, one of which is the distillery. And of course, there's a dude who probably needs to print out his AOL emails, <laughs> which is fine. Right. We can coexist exactly. in this room. It'll be totally fine. But. When you think about aesthetic and you think about what experience you want to give somebody that comes into one of your spots, right? what does that mean to you? Um, you know, ultimately what it means is uh, it, it's all about hospitality. Yeah. You know, I want them to, I want to give them something new. I want to, when they sit at my bar uh, or my restaurant, I want them to have an experience that's memorable, Yeah. you know, and, and I, I hope that we're providing that. But at the same time, I don't want to be... I don't want us to dictate too much of what happens, you know, because I think, I think going out to, to bars and, and restaurants, uh, there's a, a big element of escapism, yeah. you know, and we're there to, to ensure that they're having a good time and, and give them something new. But, but it's really, it's their world, you know what so, I mean? So give them, calibrate them, and then let them go on their own journey, kind of? Sure, yeah. absolutely. What kind of style things do you like uh, visually? What's something that really you like, maybe in terms of lighting or bar top or... Well, um, I've been accused of, of having uh, the darkest bar in the country, uh, Manifesto. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, part of that's by design, but part of, it's, uh, part of it's just the fact that it's located in the basement of a 100-year-old building with yeah. stone walls and no windows. And, and I was really, really influenced by Milk and Honey, um, which I first visited back in 2005, wow. and it, it blew my mind. And so, you know, I think you go into Manifesto and you, you see that. You see some of those elements of that that speakeasy style movement. And mm. it's really dark. It's very, very candlelit. Um, it's almost exclusively candlelit. Yeah. Um, Something sexy about dark, though. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's a little bit, um, it, it's a, it's a, quite an adjustment. You know, it's a little bit at first like, wow, what is what is going on here? Yeah. You know, but um, but I like, I think that there's room for, for everything. But I like things that are bold, yeah. if that makes sense. I don't sure. want anything, I don't want any bar... Um, or, or anything that I do to be vanilla. Yeah. You know what I mean? I want it to be bold one way or the other. Do, how about challenging? Do you want it to ever be challenging or very accessible but with your kind of style penetrating it? Does that make yeah, sense? Yeah, absolutely. I think challenging can be a good thing too. I think it, yeah. And I think a bar like Manifesto, it oftentimes can be because you know, it's only 45 seats. It's, yeah. We limit the uh, accessibility to it for that reason because it's in a, in a basement down a narrow... Uh, set of stairs and we don't want to overcrowd it and so yeah it can be challenging to get into it can be challenging to understand at times yeah for some for some people but but again that's part of the adventure you know they go away hopefully they go away having tried something they've never tried before you know i think that our our art i guess if you want to put it that way represents us right and it's almost a metaphor for us so manifesto being slightly hard and inaccessible at first but yet then loving Right. Do you feel like it's kind of an expression of you as a person that perhaps once you get to know you, then it's <laughs> deep and loving and it's very easy, but on the surface, it's maybe a little stand up? That's really funny. I've never, I've never heard See, that. anyone is... say that before. <laughs> um, 
man, I feel like I should be laying on a couch right now. <laughs> <laughs> no. We'll print um, out some emails if you're right. Uh, yeah, that's that's a really great analogy. Um, but I think one of the you know one of the missteps, one of the mistakes that people make with with bars uh, like Manifesto, uh, the the high end craft cocktail bars, the speakeasy genre, if you want to call it yeah. that. Um, I think that the the biggest mistake that people make is that once you get get in there, once you're you're settled in, it's too rigid. Yeah, and it's not hospitable enough at right. times. Now, not every in case the best ones, the ones that are going to last forever. Ones that we're going to be talking about 10, 15, 20 years from now that are still the best bars in the world, yeah. they get hospitality. They get hospitality before they get cocktails. And that is the most important thing. And Absolutely. while And while that experience of finding Manifesto, making a reservation at Manifesto, locating it in the back alley mm-hmm. on a... On a loading dock without a sign right and then getting down those stairs and tackling the the dark ambiance and the dimly lit menu with all kinds of weird ingredients but you get past all that you know and the bartender <laughs> and the server is like this, the exactly. maze of things yeah and then once the once you get through all that and the server and the bartender is there to to make your night really special and to give you something new and and delicious i hope i hope people walk away with that whole factor yeah that but that really is the most important part the end you know that's that's the thing the the overall hospitable experience ultimately is what's going to make it successful and we just turned manifesto just turned eight years old on monday that's incredible so it's uh yeah it's been uh was that number two for you yeah so i left uh uh i sold my share of the wine bar back in 2008 after two years and you know just falling out with business partners the bad bad partnership yeah and then with the idea of doing Manifesto. Manifesto was in my head at that point. It was, uh, I had a rough business plan for it and uh, uh, an idea because I, I, I went to Milk and Honey and it just, you know, it just changed my life. Yeah. And so I wanted to do that in Kansas City. And yeah, that's how Manifesto happened. We opened uh, April of 2009. That's and incredible. that ultimately, that was the spark that led to all this. Every, the reason we're here right now, Jay Rieger and company. Yeah. You know, we're in the, Manifesto's in the basement of the old, old hotel, the old Rieger Hotel. Um, and then I, a year later, opened up the restaurant on the first floor of the old hotel and started digging into the history of the building and the name. And yeah. It seems like a logical evolution. I, you know, I don't think anybody can really do it all, but it sounds like you're kind of doing it all, right? So you, st- it's, you start at one place. You're yeah. just executing drinks. Okay, fine. I'm not really thinking about it much, but of course you seem to be very, very uh, what's the word? cerebral, right? Mm-hmm. So you learn a bunch and then you execute it. You're like, I'm going to do this. And then you open a place. You're like, well, right. I'm going to open up an even different place. I mean, it, let's use Led Zeppelin as an example. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, let's so you start out, Led Zeppelin one, pretty simple, but bluesy. Very ferocious, bluesy. Yeah. Right. But then you make your way up to, uh, what's the double record? Oh my God. I can't believe it. The cashmere's on. Oh, physical graffiti. Thank you so much. So That's phys- my favorite, by the way. Yeah. That is insane. There is so many different textures and so many different types of songs. It, it's so really different. all over the place. So it seems it's like dynamic. that's where you finally have been, been able to break, right? Yeah. So these concepts now allow you to make concept records. Yeah. And it seems like a very <laughs> logical right. progression. So when you think about, it seems like history is a, is a huge influence on why you would participate and kind of start the J. Rieger distilling company or distillery like what the hell were you thinking to sh- jump sides again to go into the production side of uh, well okay so that was completely not intentional but um all i wanted was a bar and restaurant you know once i had manifesto mm. um i was i was you know, i felt really great about manifesto but we were in this building with this first floor a uh, restaurant that was struggling and i knew what they were doing wrong and yeah. having a background in fine dining you know from pierpont's I felt confident enough to do that. I'm like, okay, cool. Yeah. I could have a restaurant on the first floor, my little speakeasy craft cocktail bar in the basement. Life is good, man. Sure. You know, it, that's it. I don't want anything else. But it was, um, I, I don't know how to better describe it aside from fate, yeah. you know, I, digging into the Rieger name. I knew that we were going to call the restaurant the Rieger. Mm-hmm. We we're going to bring back that Rieger name. And that was just obvious to me. So I'm, when I'm looking into that name, trying to find old pictures of the hotel or find out who this Rieger person was and use that in, in the concept and in the branding of the restaurant, that's yeah. when I discovered that 
that family also had a distillery in Kansas City dating all the way back to 1887. Wow. A distillery yeah, yeah. with whiskey in Kansas City in the 1800s. It's like, fuck, we're way we're died more than I thought. Prohibition. Yeah. That's crazy. And so it wasn't like, I mean, I guess I, I, should, I should own it. I should take responsibility and say, yeah, it was a conscious decision. But at the same time, when I found this out, it, was, it just felt like I have to do this. Right. It would be wrong. You have not no choice. To, yeah. It was like an. It felt like an obligation. Yeah. Like yeah. this is a distillery that died it, with prohibition in Kansas City. How can I not bring this back? Right. It really felt like something that had to be done, but I never saw that coming, and I never really intended to get onto that side of it. Um, but fortunately, I think everything else that I did, I think with the bar and the restaurant and mm-hmm. um, uh, the connections that I made during all that time and the lessons that I learned. It all ended up, you know, leading up to this point yeah. and, and getting me ready uh, to, to do this. When did you guys kind of put the, uh, the first signpost in and start building the distillery? Um, well, it was, a, it was a pretty lengthy process because I discovered the, the history of the brand during the time that we were under construction at the restaurant. So the oh, restaurant okay. wasn't even open yet. Oh, shit, okay. And all of a sudden I'm distracted you know, yeah. we're trying to open up a restaurant and I've got this other, you know, it's like a splinter in my brain mm-hmm. of the, the distillery. Uh, so we're, I mean, mostly focused on the restaurant, getting that going. But in the back of my mind, like, we're going to make this happen. And I was like kind of working on it a little bit in my free right, time. Right. And then I met Andy, Andy Rieger, uh, on opening night of the restaurant. That's a familiar name. It uh, sounds familiar like it, name. right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So he's the great, great, great grandson of Jacob Rieger, who started the whole thing back in the 1880s. Wow. And I met him, and he was living in Dallas, Texas, uh, working uh, for an investment bank. Um, had no connection to the, uh, I mean, he has family connection, sure. obviously. He's the last living uh, Rieger. But, uh, you know, I said, I, he came into the restaurant, and I was like, we need to bring back your family's distillery. And he literally laughed, and he thought I was nuts. He, he'll Did tell you, he thought I was completely crazy. Was it just because... Like who gives a shit about my kind family? Of. Or you know, he'll he'll tell you that growing up he knew about it. Like there was old bottles around the house and oh, little wow. shot glasses yeah. and some of the advertisements and stuff. So they kind of knew about it. But, but I think it was something that it was um, more of a matter of fact thing. Like oh yeah, our family used to do this. Right. But no, like it. yeah, no and, legs to it. <laughs> right. And so when he walks into my restaurant in 2010. And he just wanted to say, hey, I think it's cool that you're bringing back the Rieger name, using it in the restaurant. Um, my great-great-grandfather built this hotel. Um, wow. Congratulations. Yeah. And that was going to be the end of it. I was like, no way. I just, had, I just had the, <laughs> the Rieger walk into my bar. Yeah. And I'm like, you and I are going to be business partners one day. That's and incredible. And he, he completely thought I was nuts. He sure. Did. And so well, it, took a, are nuts. it took a while for us to, you know, get around that and – and he's a, a super intelligent, uh, just really, um, he doesn't make a lot of like emotional decisions. Yeah. Very, uh, what's the word, pragmatic maybe? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. He and I are really different in that regard. Like You're I'm, a feeler. I'm more of the creative, guy. passionate type. He's the really practical, um, you know, makes the, you know, he thinks things through. Yeah, so yeah. it was about a two year process, frankly, from the time that I met him mm-hmm. to the time that it, he have finally said, yes, let's do it. And quit his job and ultimately quit his job in, in Dallas, moved back to Kansas City, and now he's at the helm of his uh, his family's company that they his, started. His namesake. Yeah. That's so cool. And so, you know, last night I finally had the chance, you know, we, we have the same distributor here, and I talked to John a bit, and he was really excited about bringing this stuff in. A lot because of your participation, obviously a lot because of t- Tom's participation, the uh, charismatic dude, right? So yeah. the whiskey is fucking incredible. You guys did a great job with that. I'll just put that out there. Right? Yeah, so thank you. I hear it's a nice blend of corn whiskey, rye, some bourbon, yeah. and Oloroso casks. 15, not Oloroso, ca- actual Oloroso sherry. It's uh, rectified. Oh. It's, not a, it's not a cask finish uh, like That's people are doing incredible. it. We, we literally rectify it with 15-year-old Oloroso sherry, which is a, a practice that was more common back in the 1800s. That's, it gives it the unctuous saltiness that I need because right. salt always cuts alcohol and salt always cuts uh, richness. Right. So it, it provides some clarity just with that. And totally. I think it's a brilliant move to do that. But the star, the golden boy, if you will, right. is, is the gin. Yeah. 
And the gin is just lovely. Great legs on it, great balance. It's light, it's bright, it's not too spicy. I think you guys have done an amazing job with that. How do you feel about the work now, now that it's kind of there, it's in a bottle, it's in the market? Well, I couldn't be more proud of it, and I had basically nothing to do with <laughs> I mean, that's, that's all Tom Nickel. Yeah. And, uh, man, I mean, sometimes I feel guilty, like, man, we cheated. You know, bringing well. in Tom Nickel. But... I mean, wouldn't you? If, if you had, I would. had the opportunity, now, I'm a we're little egoist, of... right? Like I'd be like, I'm not bringing this producer in for my songs, you know. But I get Man. it. But to him, you know, Tom is uh, he is the most accomplished gin distiller in history. That's right. I mean, yeah. the guy has, uh, you know, he made Tanqueray Number no. Ten. It's the most awarded gin ever ever created. Yeah, created Tanqueray Old Tom and Malacca, Malacca Bloomsbury. and Bloomsbury. All of it. Yeah. He had to. He had these like scribblings from Charles Tanqueray back in the 1830s, 40s, and 50s, um, where Charles Tanqueray would measure things by a scoop. Yeah, like that was he wrote down a scoop of this. Like, right. what the hell is a scoop? You know, or what the hell is a handful or a pinch? Yeah, if you're like six <laughs> right. ten, that's right? A different scale. Right now, we weigh everything out yeah. on digital scales to be super Total precise precise. and everything. But uh, Tom resurrected those things. He figured them out and he made. Some of the best gins ever made. Yeah. We're one of the largest brands in the world. And for us to now be able to call him a friend and a business partner and have him create our gin and have his name on it, man, that's uh That's crazy. That's something special. I mean it's you gotta be floored sometimes about what you've managed to accomplish. And you know, we talked about it a second ago, but just the f- fact of reflecting. Yeah. To like <laughs> <laughs> right. Where the fuck am I? Yeah, like, how did this how happen? Did, how did this happen? Yeah. You know, it's like that Talking Heads song. There's one where it's like, you just kind of wake up one day and you're like, I'm living this life. This is such a crazy place to be. And now you're in Texas, which is not so crazy. But you guys have been doing kind of like a road trip here, a tour. You're heading to San Antonio here. In just uh, like yeah, a we're bit, currently right? in the middle of a, a Texas road trip. First time I've ever done that in my life. Have you you've been to Texas before? I, though, I've right? just I've been to Austin City Limits once. Oh, uh, a couple years ago. I'm glad we caught you. Um, Jeez. So no, I haven't spent a lot of a lot of time in Texas, and this is the first time that I I've, I've been to Houston, and uh, today later today will be the first time ever in San Antonio. You'll love San Antonio, man. So Spirit. I'm enjoying it. Yeah. Obviously, I I mean road trips are a lot of fun. Yeah. And having Tom Nickel in the car with us and, and road tripping with him is a blast. And also just the sense that we're doing something. Yeah. You know, we're doing something that uh, we care about and we're passionate about. And yeah. we're, you know, we're, we're hopefully going to you know, reap these results from, from what we're doing is, is kind of a cool feeling. Yeah, it is. It's, I mean, it's a great place, huge market. There's a lot of opportunity for you guys. I, I've got a couple questions left for you before you guys head out and kind of get some breakfast sure. and stuff. The thing that I'm really intrigued is if you have this level of thought, because I know you're a very meticulous guy. I can tell you're very detail-oriented. But yeah, creative. That's the best balance, I think. Yeah. Executing details, but then having the brain to say, this is how I want things to feel. Right. Right. What the hell is left for you to accomplish? There's lots, right? You could open new bars and things like that. You're working with the distillery. But, but for you creatively, is there an un... Is, a final frontier or a frontier that you have yet to really accomplish that you really want to? You know, it's, uh, I think I'm at a point where um, personal accomplishments are not what drive me yeah. uh, these days. And that's something that, like, making the transition from being a bartender to business owner, being very creatively inspired yeah. and, and motivated and entrepreneurial, um, in a lot of ways, it's, it's selfish, you know, um, that's there, a good point. There have yeah. been times where I've been, I would absolutely say I've been very, very, very selfish yeah. and focused on what I want to do and what I want to accomplish. And now, um, I think what really drives me is getting to the point where I'm not trying to start a new restaurant or start a new bar because I have to prove something. Yeah. You know, it's not about that. It's about the people that we have working there and it's about what we already have and what it means to Kansas City, what mm-hmm. it means to my community and my neighborhood. You know, I, I, I'm more motivated now by the staff at the Rieger and at Manifesto and its place in Kansas City and how it's contributed to the overall betterment and growth of Kansas City. And right, I want right. to maintain that. I want to keep that going. And I hope that, I mean, I've seen some of my employees now. Um, I'm starting to sound old. 
I think. But I've you're seen thir- some of like my 39, own. You're right? I'm 39, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But I'm seeing some of my employees that I hired at tw- when they were 21 now go on to open up their own places and do their own But things. that's great. And that's awesome. Yeah. That's, that is much more inspiring to me right now than trying to go and open up another bar or restaurant. Yeah. And I, I really honestly don't want to open up another bar and restaurant. My goal at this point is to keep the Rieger and Manifesto there forever yeah. and build Jay Rieger and company into one of the biggest brands in the country, if not in the world. I think that we have everything, we have all the pieces in place uh, to do that. Mm-hmm. We don't want to be a craft distiller. Right. You know what I mean? We don't yeah, want to be a little mom and pop distillery. We, w- we want to take on the big brands. We want to get out there. We want people to know that Rieger's is from Kansas City. Mm-hmm. We want it to represent our hometown. And that's why we're out doing this. And so I really want to help build that as big as it can possibly It's a new challenge for sure. Be. A new new class, a new discipline, if you will. Because yeah. it's like marketing, it's advertising, it's all that kind of stuff. Did, you know, as part of what you might consider the selfish phase, right? yeah. which I get because that's entrepreneurialism 101 is being selfish. Do you, did you find it was hard to kind of maintain personal relationships and things? Oh, absolutely. You're so busy. Yeah. yeah. No, it was, that was really hard. And you have to make, if you're going to be an entrepreneur, I mean, we could, we could do a whole show about yeah. that, you know, about the sacrifices um, that entrepreneurs have to make and as well as the misperception uh, in America uh, that people have about those that own their own businesses. Yeah. A lot of people think, oh, you own your own business, so you're wealthy right. and you have all this freedom and free time. Oh, fuck that. 95% of every small business owner in, in the U.S. basically just gave themselves a 90-hour-a-week job. That's right, yeah. You know? And most of the time, if you're going to end up being good at it, you have to sacrifice your own comfort and own needs to make sure that your employees are getting what they need and what they require totally. in order to help build your business. Yeah, it's, it is. It's difficult. It's a very difficult balance right. to strike. And I think that's something we'll have to talk more about. Uh, I, I'm definitely interested in having those kinds of conversations with people and say, you, we, we serve up our bodies in this industry and we serve up our minds. Yeah. And that's the problem is it just gets raked over the coal yeah. and we got to make sure we can collect our thoughts. It, it's also that. something that's that's starting to be brought to the forefront a little yeah, bit finally, more. You start right. to see with some of the cocktail festivals um, that are happening around the country and uh, the professional organizations like the United States Bartenders Guild. And you're starting to see a lot more conversation about mental and uh, physical well-being, Absolutely. taking care of yourself in this industry, yeah. You know, addressing issues like depression and alcohol and drug abuse head on and you know you got to talk about that stuff but and and it's real it happens it's absolutely it's actually really prevalent i have lost some very very dear friends um to to those problems and sometimes it's it's the person that you just think is the happiest person on earth and they're not yeah and you know because this being an entrepreneur um being a business owner is incredibly uh stressful and taxing and then also being in such a social industry like we are, you, you've got to put on a smile every day. And you've got to go out there and, and you know, put on this face like everything is awesome. And you've yeah. got to, how can you take care of other people and, and, and express hospitality and make them feel good if you don't feel take good? Take care of yourself. Yeah. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And I agree. I think that is a new era of, of topics. And to be honest, like one of the reasons that I like chatting with people is so we can actually just talk about life. Because yeah. sometimes that just makes it, even if just a little bit better. Right. You know? um, so this is the last question I have for you, and I think I, I think I know we're gonna where we're gonna go with it. <laughs> this is my favorite part. So we were talking about some Kansas City bands and stuff last night, which is, is amazing. Yeah. And you said Shiner might be getting back together, or they're playing some shows. I've I've heard that they are going back on tour. Yeah. Amazing, because I got yeah. to see those guys again. But let's say you are at whatever bar, one of your favorite bars in the world. Okay, you can be sipping whatever you want to be sipping, but you could sit there and have a drink. With anybody living or deceased, who would you love to just sit there, have a drink, and have a great conversation with? <laughs> oh man, anybody living or deceased? I know it's a wide one. Man, that is, uh, yeah, that's a that's a tough one. Um, maybe Kurt Cobain. It's an interesting one. Yeah, I that I could see some merit to that for sure. You know, because he's, I, I mentioned that I. I, I love the grunge era, yeah. and those are my favorite bands, Pearl Jam and, and, and all them. But, but uh, 
you know, Smells Like Teen Spirit, never the album Nevermind, Nirvana, they changed the world musically. Yeah. And he was a casualty of that. He sacrificed his own his own happiness and well being yeah. for think about what he put out there into the world and the impact that he had on everyone else. It said everything and, it's, the shots were fired. Yeah. You know? I yeah. totally I, I So really, really he's a he was a fascinating uh creative brilliant creative mind. Yeah. Um but he also you know, he he was he was a lot of layers. <laughs> yeah. I think it would be it would be fascinating to dive sit in and just have a have a drink with that guy. It's a great man, it's a great answer. Yeah, I love it. massive impact on me as well. I think we're we're contemporaries, Ryan. Yeah. I, at least I hope I can say that. So dude, it's been brilliant chatting with you. Good work on the juice. Good, good luck on the Texas tour. I think you're going to find with those boots that you're going to get a lot more <laughs> right. looks and a lot more cordiality, if you will, Absolutely. in San Antonio. So best of luck. Godspeed on it. Thanks a lot, man. Thanks, mate. Well, there we have it. Kansas City's own Mr. Ryan Maybe Caught him again. He, Andy, and Tom Nickel on their Texas tour sharing the amazing J. Rieger & Co. spirits. That gin is lovely. That whiskey is really wonderful as well. That saltiness really cuts through the rest of those other blends of whiskey and just gives you just a unique style of whiskey. And Ryan talks about it a little bit here as to how that's kind of a Midwestern style of whiskey. It's something I hope to see more of. And perhaps we'll see a guitar solo record come out of Kansas City from Ryan here in the near future. We will just have to wait and see. So thanks, Ryan, for chatting with me. It really was a pleasure. And your reputation certainly preceded you. And thank you for listening to Show to V with Mike G. I've got a lot of great conversations to you release here in the near future i cannot wait to hear what you guys think about them but if you're thinking about starting a band or a startup distillery or if you're thinking man how am i ever going to afford to do any of the things i really love to do in this life please keep dancing